In Mark chapter number 15, let's begin reading in verse number 15. The Bible says, And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them, and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. The soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole band, and they clothed him with purple, and plaited a crown of thorns, and put it about his head, and began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him on the head with a reed, and did spit upon him, and bowing their knees, worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him, and put on his own clothes, uh, and put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. And they compelled one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. And they, begin, and they bring a, a, him unto the place Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of a skull. And they gave to him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, but he received it not. And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them, what every man should take. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the superscription of his accusation was written over the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two thieves, the one on his right hand, the other on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads, and saying, Ah, thou that destroyest the temple, and buildest it in three days, save thyself, and come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking, said among themselves with the scribes, He saved others, himself he cannot save. Let Christ the King of Israel descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him reviled him. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, that is, being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood by, when they heard it, said, Behold, he calleth Elias. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar, and put it on a reed, and gave, to, gave him to drink saying, Let alone, let us see whether Elias will come to take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And when the centurion, which stood over against him, saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. Let's pray. Father, we bless your holy name. We thank you for the good singing. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Lord, we're thankful when we go through valleys, you're the lily of the valleys. Lord, we're thankful when we're on the mountaintop, we can see throughout the horizons all the great things that thou hast done. Now, Father, I pray for the next few minutes you'd arrange the atmosphere where our hearts and our minds recall how great a God you really are. Father, I pray for those that may be here struggling today, they'd find strength. I pray for those that are doubting, they'd find faith. Lord, I pray for those that are in the valley, that, Lord, you would comfort them and remind them you're still there and that you care. But, Lord, my heart is really concerned for those that might be in our presence unsaved, lost without God. Lord, they heard the good talent in the singing, but they didn't understand the meaning of the singing. Lord, they've heard the words of God being read, but they've never received the Lord Jesus Christ, the living Word of God in their heart. So, Father, I pray the sweet Holy Ghost through cords of love would draw them to an altar of repentance. Lord, they get saved by the good grace of God. Now, Father, help us. Lord, we stand in a place where no man can stand alone. Put a hedge about us. The devil would like nothing better than to distract or disrupt the service. God, I pray for the sick and afflicted. You'd help them. I pray for those that are watching on the live stream. You'd be with them. But, Father, help us now, Lord, to truly, from our hearts, cry, This is the Son of God. 
we'll bless you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. In these verses, we find what Christians for 2,000 years have heralded, that Jesus was crucified, that he was buried, and then he rose again according to the Scriptures. That is the gospel, the good news. The good news is you don't have to die and go to hell because of what Jesus did. Jesus made a way for you and I to be forgiven of our sin and get to go to glory and abide with Him forevermore. You see, when man chose to sin, the hope of man died. Man at one time fellowship with God. But then man chose to disobey God and sin came in the world and sin passed upon all men. Uh, folks say, if God's real, how come I can't see Him because of sin? He is real, friend. Yep. Say, how do you know? Well, I've done talk with him today. I've done spent some time with him today. He's already kind of flickered in my heart a little today. Uh, he's real, and if you'll believe on him, you'll know he's real too. But I want to look at some things that Jesus did, uh, what they did to him in, in this chapter. I want you to notice they scourged him. In verse 15, the Bible says, And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas, the thief, the re uh, resurrectionist, the one who tried to uh, defy Rome, uh, he released him, a murderer. Why? To content the people. Let me just help you right here. It never matters what the law says. Those in positions of authority will always do what will keep their jobs. That might help some of you. Outside your King James Bible, the greatest document ever been penned down is the Constitution of the United States of America. But it's worthless if people don't adhere to it. He contented the people you read the early part of the chapter, he knew in himself Jesus wasn't worthy of death. Hmm? And then it says, he delivered Jesus when he had scourged him. Uh, if you're just reading that, that doesn't mean much to you. But that word scourged him simply means that they took a, a whip of their day, which was a cat of nine tails, uh, it was a, a, a handle with leather straps that came off of it. And on the end of those leather straps were bone fragments and pottery fragments. Uh, and they would uh, uh, take a man and tie him to a whipping post and put his hands above his head where he was uh, almost standing on his tippy toes. Uh, and they would begin to uh, uh, thrash him with this cat of nine tails. Uh, and it would wrap around his body, and as they would pull it back, uh, it would pull the flesh from them, uh, then it would pull the uh, uh, muscle from them, uh, and it would literally rip that man into shreds. Uh, can I say, under Jewish law, they thought if they whipped a man like that with 40 stripes, that was inhumane. So Jews would whip him with 39 stripes. But the Jews did not scourge Jesus, the Romans did. And when Rome was involved, they always wanted to put fear in people to make certain nobody else would be like Barabbas and would raise up their ugly head against Rome. Roman centurions were known to whip a man as many as a hundred times. All I know is Isaiah said his visage was so marred, uh, much more than any man. Uh, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ was beaten beyond recognition uh, uh, for the, uh, the sole reason because uh, he wanted to be your sacrifice and my sacrifice. We see they scourged him. I want you to know, secondly, they smote him. Verse number 19, the Bible says... Uh, and they smote him on the head with a reed. They took a reed and they smacked him upside the head with it. We're only talking about the darling Son of God. We're only talking about He who was holy and no guile was found in His mouth. 
We're talking about the one who, when they came to arrest him, they asked him if he was Jesus. Uh, he said, I am, and the power of his voice knocked him down. They scourged him. They smote him. And can I say they scoffed at him? In verse number 20 it says, And when they mocked him, they took off the purple robe from him, put on his own clothes, uh, and they led him to crucify. Can I say this? They made fun of him. They got down and worshipped him in mockery. They made fun. Now listen, you can talk bad about me all you want to, but when you mock me to my face, there's something inside of me that wants me to put Jesus on the shelf and do a little hillbilly justice with you. Can you imagine the one who created man is now being mocked by man? How he must have felt. But see, he couldn't lash out in anger or else he would have defiled himself and he couldn't have been our Savior. They scoffed him at him. Can I say this? They suspended him between heaven and earth. Verse 24, and when they had crucified him. Can I say in suspending him... They pierced his hands and feet with spikes. They nailed him to two pieces of timber. And they raised him and dropped that cross in a hole. Now they tell me that when they would erect that cross and drop it in the hole, the very blunt force, the trauma of that thing stopping in that hole would cause some men's bones to come out of joint. The jar must have been uncanny. After he's been beaten to within an inch of his life, his back laid open, and now is pressed against a, a rough piece of timber, the sp splinters themselves in those open wounds, can you imagine? They not only pierced his hands and his feet before they suspended him, they platted his head with a crown of thorns. The very spikes of those thorns pierced the skin from his brow. Can I say he wore that crown of thorns to save us from every diabolical and demonic thought we'd ever have? Can I say he was suspended for every time that you and I feel like we don't belong anywhere? Can I say that he was smote for every time that we would kick against him in our sin? He was beaten with stripes that we should have taken, but with his stripes we are healed. Can I say they parted his garments? So they put on a purple robe on him and they mocked him, but then they took that very robe. And that robe being a costly robe, can, can I say you have to understand that in order to get purple dye in those days, uh, they'd have to squeeze a certain worm and get the blood from that worm and use that as a dye. And it was a very lengthy process and an expensive process. Uh, and uh, uh, rather than to split it and each of them have a piece, uh, they gambled for his robe preached one time and them men down there gambling on that robe I preached on playing games at the foot of the cross many people come to church playing games with the things of God and can I say this they scorned him look at verse 29 and they that passed by railed on him wagging their heads, saying, All thou that destroyest this temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself, come down from the cross. Likewise the chief priests, mocking, said among themselves with the scribes, He saved others, himself he cannot save. Let, the, let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. Uh, and they that were crucified him reviled him. I mean, everybody's just scorning him. You see, had he come down, they would not have believed and there would not be any hope for us. He'd already done so many works before them, they should have known. But they scorned him. 
going to preach for just a few minutes on Jesus' most torturous event. All the things that I just mentioned in his flesh was traumatic beyond our understanding. But those things weren't the most torturous thing that he'd go through. I want you to look with me in verse number 34. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That verse right there reveals the worst thing that Jesus would go through. Said he cried with a loud voice. I want you to notice what was behind the cry. Can I say this is a cry of abandonment? He says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now I know why he had to say that. Uh, we'll get to it in a minute. But can I say this? Uh, he said that, Brother Mike, but you can never say that. Jesus said He would never leave us nor forsake us. Uh, we'll never be forsaken. Uh, we'll never know what it is to experience what He experienced right there. Uh, uh, my dear friends, uh, we ought to bless His holy name. It's a cry of abandonment. You see, when he was in Gethsemane, uh, and the dark hour of Gethsemane, Jesus uh, was reassured by the Father. Uh, but here in the darkest hour of Golgotha, he is rejected by the Father. Can I say, he who was rejected by man, he came unto his own, his own received him not, is now rejected by the Father. You have to understand that since the Alpha, the beginning, God's always been. And the Godhead is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They're three in one. Now our little feeble pea brains can't understand how three separate entities can be one, but they are. They're all three God. Uh, and can I say they've always... Uh, been in unity. They've always been in fellowship. Uh, they've always been the same. Uh, but we find even though uh, 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 the Father was in heaven, the Son was on the earth, they're still in communion. They're still the same. Uh, uh, but hey, uh, uh, on the cross of Calvary, uh, when Jesus uh, cried uh, this cry of abandonment, it was because for the first time uh, and the only time uh, in the history of history uh, of the Father Father and the Son are no longer in fellowship. The Father has rejected and abandoned the Son. Now if you are here and you're a father and you have a son, both my boys are here, can you even grasp taking your son, dropping him somewhere that he's never been, and rejecting him and no longer having anything to do with him? God forsook God when Jesus died on Calvary. Why Jesus is there, why He's crying, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? No comfort came. Can I say, uh, no caress came. Can I say, no conversation came. The father didn't uh, uh, speak and say, it'll be okay. Nothing. God forsook God. Because God cares about you and me. It's a cry of abandonment. It's a cry of agony. And agony shows the severe mental strain that he's going through. Can I say I've known people who have suffered in an abusive relationship and they say the physical pain hurts but the mental pain is worse than the physical pain. And here in agony 
the Son of God, cries, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The mental strain is weighing on him because of the removal of the Father. Just a few hours prior, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he says, uh, let, not, uh, let this cup pass from me, uh, but not my will, thy will be done. He was willing to let the cup be removed if he didn't have to be removed from the Father, but to fulfill and be faithful, he goes to the cross. He's in agony because of the removal of the Father. He's in agony because of the ridicule of hell. In Psalm 22, we get the prophecy of what would happen on this dark day. In verse number 12, the Bible says, this is what is Jesus uh, is going through uh, uh, on the cross. He says, many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me around. Uh, they gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. Now, Brother Donald, you've been saved long enough to know that sometimes the devil come put thoughts in your mind and he won't leave you alone and he'll agon you know, make you feel agony and like, leave me alone, devil. Can you imagine many strong bulls of hell gaping on him while he's on the cross telling him he's not the son of God telling him he's, he's going to be defeated that Satan is going to finally win. Can you imagine all the torment in his mind just from the demons of hell. He's in agony because he's being racked with pain. I don't know about you, but do you ever lay down at night and something hurts you and you can't rest because of the pain? Maybe it's a pain in your knee or in your ankle or bless God every now and then I'm getting old and sometimes a gal will flare up in a big toe of mine and I just soon they cut the toe off. It's one thing to hobble around during the day, but when you lay down at night, that thing makes you, it makes you feel like your whole body's hurting. His whole body was hurting. He's racked with pain and the agony he's suffering. It's a cry of agony. It's a cry of abandonment. Can I say it's a cry of affliction? 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Why did God forsake him? Because Jesus had to become our sacrifice. And the Bible says in Isaiah that 53 that the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. You see, when that high priest would take that lamb, he would confer the sins of the people of Israel upon that land. My dear friends, when Jesus became our lamb, he had to become our sin. And the Bible makes it clear that He paid for our sins. He was afflicted by our sin. It was your sin. It was my sin. That caused Him so much agony. Brother Brian... I haven't even got to shake your hand yet today. Let me come back here and shake your hand, brother. You know, I love you. But can you imagine him dying for all your sins? Your past sins. Your present sin. And even sin you've yet to commit. He paid for it that day. Isn't that a blessing? I'm glad I'm saved from my sin. I'm glad he doesn't remember it anymore. Because there's nothing to remember. It's gone. It's gone. Man tries to bring it up every now and then, but I just point him to the blood. It's gone. But I want you to think about when he became sin. The imputation of sin shred him from his glory. Now think about that. 
You remember when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration and he could no longer let this flesh conceal his glory and he would just uh, uh, reveal himself there and Peter and James and John fell on their face. They saw him in his glory on the Mount uh, and Moses and Elijah showed up uh, and when it's all said and done, Peter being a loud mouth, kind of like me, just had to say something. He said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let's build a temple for you, for Moses and Elijah. Well, that wasn't the will of God, but it was just something about seeing him in his glory. You see, when he put on flesh, he hid his glory. When he became sin, he was stripped of his glory. Think about the affliction. He who is the light, and he'll be the light of the celestial city. You know he's the light of the city. He's the glory of God. That's what's going to lighten New Jerusalem. Now he's become darkened by sin. Look at verse 33. The Bible says, and when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. Sixth hour was noon, ninth hour is three o'clock. Three hours, there's total darkness. Now, I've preached it, many preachers have preached, and God turned out the light so man couldn't see how, uh, uh, what their sin did to the Savior. But I submit unto you, Jesus, who is the light, was stripped of his light by your sin and my sin. Light was replaced with darkness for the only time in history. Because light dispels darkness. But the light's been stripped from him. He's in affliction. Our sin violated his purity. It's a cry of affliction. Hallelujah, it's a cry of atonement. Leviticus 17.10 says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. Ephesians 1.7, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. I like Colossians 2.14. This is what he did on the cross, uh, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances uh, that was against us, which were contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Uh, Every one of us sitting in this uh, 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 sanctuary this morning are violating the law of God. We all have blended fabrics. That's one of the laws. You couldn't break that. We've all broken that just come to the house of God. We all fail the grace of God every single day. But what Jesus did is he took those ordinances and those things we could never keep and he nailed them to the cross and he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Uh, he said, if any man will drink of the water of life freely, uh, 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 whosoever will may come. I mean, he made a way that us who couldn't keep the law. And by the way, we weren't even given the law. We were Gentile dogs. There was no hope for us. Uh, but he grafted in a branch in the vine, uh, and he made a way where all sinners could be saved. Uh, it's a cry of atonement. Mm, he went through this torturous event that you and I could have life and life more abundantly. Can I say, I want you to think now, he who gave the penalty under the law for sin is now paying the price for sin. It's a cry of affliction. But then let me say this lastly. It's a cry of affection. Jesus went through what Jesus went through because he loves you and he loves me. First John chapter number 4 verse 9 says, In this, in what? In what Jesus did on the cross. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Here it is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and he sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. They just sang about the everlasting love of God. And Jeremiah tells us he's loved us with an everlasting love. Amen. There's never been a time when you haven't been loved. God has loved you since you were conceived in the womb. And he manifested his love in what he did on the cross. There's a cry of affection. He cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son 
that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He proved his love on Calvary. Let me help you with this. I'll be done. He chose to die so that you and I would have a choice to live. He chose, Miss Jackie, to go to the cross for your sin so that one day you'd have the choice to believe on Him and live forevermore. Everything that needed to be done for your sin to be forgiven, cleansed, taken away, and for you to have a home and the abode of God in glory forevermore was accomplished through the finished works of Calvary. Can I help you with something? He tasted death for every man. And he made salvation available for every man. The only thing keeping you from being saved is you not choosing to believe on the Lord. Today you can be saved from your sin because of what Jesus did for you on Calvary. But Jesus is a gentleman. He won't force you to get saved. But he bids you to. He invites you to. And he'll save you if you come. You just got to be sick of you and want to be saved from you and from your sin. If you want to be saved, he'll save you today. If you are saved, you ought to be thankful that he separated himself from the Father so you can never be separated from him. When's the last time you just thanked him for saving you? When's the last time you just loved him back? And he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. When's the last time he was your first thought and your last thought? When's the last time you appreciated all that he did for you to be able to sit on that church pew and worship today? What a Savior. What a Savior. It was a torturous event for him so you and I wouldn't be tortured in hell for all of eternity. You can be saved today. You're not saved. In the moment, we're going to have an invitation. We invite you to come. Just come. Get saved. Hallelujah. Get born again. There's nothing like it. If I get saved for you, I would. But if you've been saved, why are you cold this morning? Why is there distance between you and Him this morning? Why isn't that fire burning this morning? I read this this week. Some people stir the fire. Some people stay in the fire. But far too many stop the fire. I just want to stay in the fire. Yeah. And you know what will help keep you in the fire? When you look at what Jesus did for you. And that He's willing to save you, to hear you when you cry, to help you along life's journey. Oh, what a Savior. When was the last time you just told Him, Oh, what a Savior. If we just look it back at how much he loved us and fall in love with him again, we'd have revival. It could break out today. How can we expect sinners to walk an aisle and get saved when we won't walk an aisle and tell Jesus how much we're thankful for what he done for us? I wonder this morning, when was the last time you told him you loved him? When was the last time you were grateful when you looked at what he done for you? If you're here today and you've never been born again, we sure would love to introduce you to him. I'm going to ask Tab family to come get a song of invitation. While they're coming, we're going to pray. Then, friend, God spoke to your heart. Why don't you just do business with God? If you're here today and God's just telling you you need to be saved, say, preach, I don't know how to get saved. Come, we'll take a Bible show you how to get saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. They're getting a song. Let's pray. Father, we love you. There are not words to express our gratitude for Calvary. God, we sure do thank you for what little bit that we understand that you went through for our sin, that we might be saved. Now, Lord, I pray some have already come to the altar. God, help folks do business with God. God, if there's somebody here today unsaved, lost without God, I pray today would be the day of their salvation. Bless this invitation. Get glory now, Father. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 
If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.